Alexa. Um, let me just introduce, this is the, an insider's look at the politics of reviewing translations. And um, this is an exciting roundtable which is co-moderated. This is my co-moderator, Lucina Schell. Hi. I'm Avia Koshner. Lucina will introduce herself first, then I'll introduce myself, then each panelist will introduce him or herself, as the case may be. And uh, we'll get going. Okay, so Lucina, tell us about yourself. <coughs> All right, so I'm Lucina Shell. I uh, created and edit the site readingandtranslation.com, <coughs> which is dedicated to publishing reviews of translations written by translators. In addition, we publish um, some interviews with publishers and other content related to the industry, but mainly it's reviews. Um, and we're trying to fill the void in reviewing in which translators are really kind of ignored. Um, and the aspect of translation is not evaluated. That's what we emphasize. It's wonderful. OK, many people in the room know me. I'm Avia Kushner. I'm a writer. I write about translation and about living between languages. Uh, my first book will be out in August. It's called The Grammar of God, A Journey into the Words and Worlds of the Bible. And I review uh, and write about literature and translation frequently for the Wilson Quarterly, the Iowa Review, Tri Quarterly, the Jerusalem Post, blah, blah, blah. And so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, sitting next to me is Minna Proctor. Do you want me to stand? Um, would standing help or yes. sitting yes. okay? Yes. And can you, <laughs> can you hear us or do you need a, uh, does a, would a microphone just help? for recording, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not broadcasting. I'll just self-broadcast. No, 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 Twitter feed. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm Minna Proctor. I, um, I edit the Literary Review, which um, publishes work in translation, includes some essays uh, that are kind of like reviews. I also do a great deal of book reviewing, um, and often am given, bless you, books in translation to review. That's my beat. I'm the translation girl. Um, and I review mostly now for Book Forum. Um, and that's enough. Oh, and I translated more in the olden days from Italian, but not anymore as much. Hello, I'm Scott Esposito. Uh, I work at a place called Two Lines Press, which is a program of the Center for the Art of Translation. Um, I write a lot of reviews about translations. They get published in a lot of places. I'm sure that'll come up and stuff. Uh, I also edit a publication called The Quarterly Conversation. We cover a lot of translations. So yeah, lots of translation in my life. And tell us about the places you review for, which are so interesting. Oh. Right, reviews. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, like the TLS, Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, um, I don't know, smaller venues. Mm -hmm. um, I've done some work for Book Forum before, I don't know, Random, random stuff. It's all up there on my website. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning. I'm Eric Lorber. I'm the director of Brain Taxi. Uh, we're an organization that champions independent literary culture. Uh, so we're not translation specific, but we do uh, cover a lot of translation in different ways. Uh, we publish a quarterly book review journal. Uh, you're welcome to have a copy if you'd like today, if you don't know it. Uh, we also hold events, and translators and foreign language authors often speak at those. And we publish uh, literary chat books, and again, some of those are in translation. Oh. Good morning, I'm Scott Benham, and unlike most everybody else on the panel, my primary you know, way of earning my living is not reviewing or translating, though I've translated Thomas Mann. And no, that's, the, that's not a primary way of learning. <laughs> 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 Flavor of love. Uh, for the New England Review, but I'm a teacher. I teach at Davidson College, which is a small, highly selective liberal arts college in North Carolina. Um, and over the last four or five years, um, several of us who have done literary translation have started teaching about literary translation. And so the connection here is that when we select a text for a classroom, in some ways, that's kind of like reviewing. You know, we tell them what they should read for the, you know, that. So that's, that's where I am here. Uh, well, as you can see, we're really lucky to have such a wonderful panel with such a diverse uh, array of publications that are represented here. My first question to everyone is the most basic, okay? How do you figure out what is an important book? Oh, Lucas just. Oh, hi, hi. Lucas. Oh, okay, let's add. <laughs> Lucas, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, boy. And we'll get you a chair. Okay. Um, you have to stand for your introduction anyway. I stand for my introduction. <laughs> I'm Lucas Fine. Uh, I've reviewed a lot of translations. 
closest to me. Maybe I'll ask Minna. How do you, how does that happen? When you, in terms of assigning reviews or, yes. or pitching a yes. review? Yes, yeah. What matters? Um, uh, well, I think that, um, well, with, with the interesting thing about books and translation is that there's, a, oh, from, from the assigning reviews end of things, um, if you're an editor and you've got a whole lot of books coming in, the interesting thing about books in translation is that they, the different rules apply. If you're, if you're dealing with a mainstream publication, there's little kind of keys that you're supposed to follow, like, oh, this is from this publishing house, or this is this author that everybody's excited about. And in translation, for the most part, it's, it's, <coughs> there, are no, there are no kind of obvious indicators, everything is, you have to look at everything. You have to look at everything anew, read into it. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to, um, at, at the places, at, at TLR, the literary review, or I used to do book review assignments at um, Bomb Magazine, um, we, things would come in and they were in translation, so we were interested in them because they were in translation, and then we'd look at the, um, you, you really have to read into the pages because in many cases with work in translation it's new to you mm -hmm. and um, and you can also assume that the latest translation of Kafka the Times is going to handle and so you don't need to worry it's not your business with you're working in independent in an independent environment you don't need as much to worry about that so um, so there aren't as many obvious keys you have to find something that you respond to um, so you look at the matter that's included the publicity material and you probably read um, seven of the poems really fast in the first chapter of the book wow. and go from there. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I would. Yeah. <coughs> Ooh, okay. I'm just I know, gonna be and really I held weird. it in the wrong place. I'm just, I'm just going to lay right there and see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah, so no, I, I definitely agree, like, it's, it's hard to find, like, keys or maybe, like, the keys that you do look at are a little switched up from stuff that's natively written in English. Um, but I feel like I have to try to triage a little bit because like, there's a lot of these books and a lot of them look really cool and a lot of them come from presses whose names I don't recognize so it's hard to kind of make judgments based on that. Um, so I rely on my friends a lot. Like I know a lot of people in this industry and just kind of having regular conversations and stuff with, like, like that with them, um, you, you kind of build up a certain knowledge base and you do recognize names and things pop out at you so you know I just I just kind of try to stay on top of what people are finding interesting at the moment um, you know and again like stuff like Twitter and Facebook are really good for that you can just kind of pick up what people are talking about at the moment and that stuff stays on your mind um, I also I use the names of translators you know I mean, sorry I I love some of you more than others. I, I love you all in some sense, I'm sure. But you know, but definitely like, like it's like getting a good recommendation from a friend. You just come to trust someone who has similar tastes to your taste, um, who you know is gonna do a good job with it. So that definitely is like I'll key in on. I'll also key, on, key in on the names of presses. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to ever not look at stuff from a press that I haven't heard of, but definitely some presses have established in my mind that they represent quality or they represent an aesthetic that is also my aesthetic. So those are all kind of things that I'm looking at when I try to triage, although also I, I agree with Minna, you know, you try to read as much as you can. Uh, and also just to kind of chime in on the whole, the Times is gonna do Kafka thing. I mean, I definitely agree with that. And there are certain things that I'll feel less pressure to cover because I feel like they have a good chance of getting out there. But you know, but in a, in a periodical like the quarterly conversation, or probably you know some of the others represent on this panel, um, we're going to give a look at that Kafka that's going to be very different from like the Times' look, mm -hmm. and I think that's like a really valuable thing to put out there, especially nowadays when someone googling like new Kafka translation is probably going to find our review fairly easily. So I mean, I think it's important just to get that out there if you can. Mm -hmm. oh, I, have to, yeah. I wonder if you can chime in. You know, which translations get reviewed? Sure. Well, at, at the risk of um, being contrarian so early in the morning, um, I do want to say that uh, 
that I'd caution against thinking that a reviewed book is uh, a more important book than a not reviewed book. Um, there's, I mean, as Scott has laid out, there's so many vectors that go into uh, a selection process that um, certainly merit is one of them. Uh, uh, but I think that um, it's important to kind of destabilize some hierarchical thinking about that. Uh, for me, uh, the, the key element is whether I have a writer who can bring a combination of passion and acumen to the task. Um, and so, that, so it might not be a book that is necessarily um, uh, the be all and end all of this season's publishing, uh, but to have someone who can discuss it um, uh, you know, with some grit, uh, would I think uh, foment a, a, an important <coughs> critical dynamic. <laughs> so, from my point of view, as uh, as you know, an academic and as a, a primarily a, a teacher, the parallel here would be, say, in uh, the course meeting in May for next fall's um, first semester of a four-course sequence on the called the Western Tradition, which is you know Gilgamesh to postmodernism over four semesters, and about a, uh, a fifth of the whole class takes that. So it's a, it's a kind of a legacy course at Davidson College. And so we're wondering, you know, what Homer are we going to, what Odyssey, or what Iliad, whatever we're doing that year. Um, and most of the people teaching in that class are not classical philologists, but, you know, impassioned readers of translation, because that's what we teach. Is, and so we're going to um, go to the to Google and see, you know, who is talking about, you know, the relationship between, you know, a new Homer translation to older ones. But that's just the start of the conversation because then we have to think, is this going to cost students twenty nine ninety five or is it going to be free from, you know, Gutenberg or, you know, and sometimes we, we have a stack of 10 or 15 texts that students are going to buy and we will often choose a 19th century translation because it's out of copyright and free and talk about that in class and say, you know, here's an excerpt from this. This person made choice about verse, about, you know, domesticating a text, all the kind of stuff that you all do. But we have very different concerns. And then that becomes the canonical text. They know, you know, um, sometimes the Iliad, you know, from, from a text that's very distant from our world right now as a translation. So that's an, that's an interesting aspect. Imagine that. Right. And Eric, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, not having the right writer to write about a book could take it out of consideration. Is that a fair understanding? Uh, that's absolutely fair. Um, uh, but I'd like to make the glass half full sure. and say uh, <laughs> having the right writer for a project can make it really exciting. Uh, <laughs> yesterday we posted a review, I was just mentioning, of, of Kurt Tukalski. Uh, two books in translation, uh, it, and I feel like we just had the perfect writer for it. I'm not saying these everyone should run out and get these books, yeah. but uh, but well, I feel I like we have a piece yeah, that that <laughs> makes that you know that creates some interest, and we wouldn't have had that piece without the right person. Yeah, so, I'll just yeah. I'll just yeah. like yeah. add in here on the whole on that subject. I mean, I I totally agree with what you're saying, and like it definitely comes through. Like when I'm reading a review that someone submitted to me, um, you know, like a lot of times it just isn't very compelling or it doesn't sound like the book is being talked about in a way that makes the book sound interesting or kind of shows its best side to the public. And I mean, that's something that I really wouldn't want to publish just because, you know, it makes the book sound boring and people are going to be bored by reading it. So no one's going to want to read my journal. And it's not really doing the book any service if you're making an interesting thing sound boring. And I mean, that's kind of my own criteria, too, as a critic. You know, I'm always trying to find kind of the most interesting angle on a book to talk about it. Even, you know, we were talking before this panel about positive reviews versus negative reviews. And I feel like either one of them can have value if you are actually keying in on what makes a book an interesting thing to discuss and talking about that in an intelligent way. So I'm always trying to do that as a critic. Um, the reviews that I hate writing the most are when I just have something where I'm kind of like, eh, and you know, and there's nothing really to say about it. And it can be really hard to like fill up 800 words, which is not a lot of space on a book like that. Yeah. 
Is it fair to say that uh, translations of languages that are rarely revered, or translations from countries which somehow don't have writers who write about them a lot? Um, I'm thinking back to, to my time in graduate school. I remember there was a, a Mongolian writer from Kun Pedro, for instance, okay? And apparently a major writer in Mongolia, it was very difficult to get him uh, any play because there was no one who was particularly interested in Mongolia at that time. Uh, can we talk about that? Are, are, are some countries or some languages more likely to get revered than others? Uh, in my experience, yes, um, but uh, I think that those of us in the field should actually make an extra effort. I mean, it comes down to that. Uh, we have a review in this issue of a book from the Inuit, and uh, the, re the reviewer does not know Inuit, I'll confess, uh, but we felt it was really important to, uh, but does know history of the region, and, and felt it was really important, largely because this wasn't going to get a lot of play in a lot of places. to make, make it more likely that mm -hmm. an unusual book like the one you're describing, Eric, uh, would get played? Is there something a translator can do? This is my yeah. Yeah, Please, okay. yeah, please. <laughs> um, it, it, I'm just kind of um, rehearsing something that we talked about at the Alta Conference in Rochester. Right. But I'm a firm believer in translators getting involved in um, preparing a, a little bit of peripheral material for their book. I think that. Um, if, if you do think about reviewers or even editors, look, you know, sometimes I look for serial for work to put in the magazine or I'm looking for work to write about. Um, I think that if you, if you as a writer or a translator think about piles of books that are coming into editors and you're being plucked out of a pile, if, you, if you're able as a translator to somehow provide any kind of extra material that will give an, an editor um, a a road map into the book, especially if it's Mongolian or <laughs> if it's something that is in, in many ways extra foreign, um, which is probably another panel, um, but if it's more foreign than the regular foreign, um, if you as a translator can provide almost like a story or a narrative about the book, how you came to the book, how the author came to the world, any kind of, any kind of tale or story about the work to accompany the work, I actually think um, gives, gives all of us more interest, more reason to be interested in it. And that's really what you want to do is peak interest. Um, stories help. Stories are really, really useful, even if it's like a, um, even if it's like a, a language poet from Mongolian that's almost in many ways inaccessible. If there's a really good story around it, there's some way into the work. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll just yeah. add to that. Um, Definitely, like, translators are probably the best people in terms of being in a position to talk about a book in an interesting way. I mean, you more likely than not love this book. You've worked with it for a long time. And you know what makes this book interesting. Uh, I know that not everyone really feels confident in terms of, like, writing a whole essay about the book that is translated or stuff like that. Uh, interviews are a really good way to kind of get into that if you have someone posing intelligent questions to you. I feel like that can really kind of help you articulate what you like about a book. Um, and there are lots of websites these days who are actually fairly interested in running interviews with translators. So, you know, if you guys seek those out, um, you know, if you can just make like a pretty good pitch, like key in on those one or two things that makes your book noteworthy, a lot of times people will be really interested in interviewing you. Um, and also, I know that like not everyone totally loves social media, but definitely just like having a presence there and putting out you know, this is my new book, this is an interesting thing about it. Like, that does kind of get around, and that's where I, for one, get a lot of information. So I would encourage you to have some kind of a presence up there. If you're, um, uh, I would caution against just sort of becoming a second publicist. Uh, that's not typically what the book needs from an editor's point of view. Um, uh, but I do absolutely, from what I understand, translators can sometimes feel a little effaced uh, in the world. And, <laughs> and um, I do, I do uh, really concur uh, with both Min and Scott that to be present, to have your voice there, I mean, uh, not even as an editor, as a reader of translations, I'm, uh, I would welcome a lot more uh, translators' prefaces afterwards, context. Um, I love that stuff. And the more it can be in the world, the more people remember 
that you were part of the process. Um, and uh, yeah, so being present, I would also say the same thing about uh, doing that in person. Uh, and that's why in our, in our reading series and book festivals, we regularly uh, include foreign language uh, authors and translators. Uh, it, it reminds people, hey, you're a real person. Um, and sp if you're able to speak publicly, even a short thing at a local bookstore, or whatever, I think is great. Let me add to that. Um, from so, in not the, the bad news about you know not buying translations from you all, but in the course that <laughs> that several of those who have done literary translation developed called the theory and practice of literary translation, I'd be happy to send, you know, post the syllabus on the right. Davidson Journal on my web page or something, and to get suggestions from you all. So. It's a workshop creative writing course, and students bring uh, translations from various languages, so we're all not reading the same languages. And the capstone project in the course, there's two. One is a soiree, which is sort of like the uh -oh. declamation here, I guess, which I, is my first Alta. I'm really excited. Uh, the other is a translation and two framing essays. One is about the, it, one is a kind of annotation section about problems and puzzles and choices. And one is a context essay, just the kinds of things you're talking about. And students um, go to good models of that. And that's some of the most exciting intellectual work for us in the group because they're, t they're teaching us about this contemporary Arab, Arab poet or this Brazilian writer or you know that none of us know about, but we all know about the process. And so from the point of view of the, the real intellectual work that happens in the classroom around teaching uh, how, tr how literary translation works. These, uh, you know, what Jeanette would call like the paratext, this is fundamental. This is really, really fundamental. And models, there are great models out there that, you know, you all are looking for and that people produce. So that's, that's key for us as a, t as a teacher. This is all really helpful. I'm just going to take a dip into the negative for one minute and ask if besides the cost, besides the lack of an appropriate writing, are there any other reasons why a book in translation would get knocked out of consideration just off the top? Anything else you can think of that would make a book an automatic no for an editor or reviewer that would be good to know about? Be, be pretentious, be boring. I mean, those are, those are red flags that we use. Yeah. Have, have, the wor have the worst design and production values possible. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, honestly, like, don't judge a book by its cover, but when things just come in the mail and they look sad and poorly made, it's, it's hard to feel excited about them. I've reviewed books that were poorly designed. You have? Not okay. all of them. Yeah, no, I mean, sometimes they're really good. It's just like, if you get, like, five packages, you're going to want to go to the pretty one. That's just... <laughs> I mean, it, it, it depends on the periodical, totally. Uh -huh. um, you know, in my experience, not, not a ton. And we were, we were talking about this before, um, before the panel. Um, but like, when, when I'm writing for like, very large circulation mainstream venues, you know, they don't care at all. The only one that I've experienced that really is a plus is the TLS, and that's why I love them. And why, yeah, and why I consider that they actually really care about translation. I mean, that's an important thing to them. And they'll often know about things before I know about them. Like they're the only place that will like send me stuff that I've never heard of, and it'll be really great. But you know, but a lot of times, um, you know, that stuff will get cut out, or that stuff just really isn't isn't required in any meaningful sense. But then you know, when you're writing for other kinds of more journaly things, you know, that's that's like a plus. But those are those are usually involving people who have some investment in translation. Either the editor does, or the journal is like specifically a translation journal? Um, I, um, I found that as a reviewer, um, this length has a lot to do with it. A TLS review is going to be very long. Um, that I've done you know, 500, 700 word reviews where you barely have the time to kind of talk about the book Absolutely. and the author. And so it's difficult to say something that sometimes in order to avoid saying with a lyrical translation by blah, 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 to, you know, <laughs> in, in a way, like to avoid the offense of 
saying something really glib and offhand in like a parenthetical that you might actually be able to fit in. Um, I won't. I won't talk about it. Um, but um, but then when you're working in a, in a length in a, in a sort of medium length, which is what I tend to work on. Um, the Tell us what is medium length. To me, medium length. medium length is sixteen hundred words. Wow! Um, that's, wow, that's pretty long. And and that it is long. That and long. it is long. And and I feel like I have space in sixteen hundred words, but not in a thousand. Often, right. um, at that point, for, for me as a reviewer, the 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 and the editors don't care if you can make a good argument for talking about translation, then it stays. If you're doing it, kind of pro forma it's likely to get cut because yeah. for space. But I mean, if you've incorporated it into the review, it makes sense. It has something to do with the book. It's re all related. They're not going to cut it just because it's about translation. They're going to cut it because it's not directly related to your main point. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with the medium length essay is how much the translation is part of the story about a book that you're telling as yeah. a reader and a reviewer. Yeah, just, I mean, I just respond to a few of those points, which, I mean, I, I agree totally with what you're saying. Um, it, it should always be germane to kind of the flow of what you're saying. Like, I just, I just wrote a uh, review of the new book by Patrick Modiano, the Nobel laureate, and it's like an 800-word review, and I got to the end of it, and I hadn't mentioned the translator, and I felt really awful about that. <laughs> I mean, no, really. Like, I really tried to get it in every time, but I just, you know, I was like, there is no possible seam here for this to fit in anywhere. I don't know if I can do this. Um, that all being said, even like those really kind of short mentions where you're like, you know, this is an excellent translation by so-and-so. Um, I mean, I, I used to be of the school of like, don't include that. Like, that's just so kind of minor. It's not worth it. But a lot of translators have actually told me, like, I really appreciate seeing just that. <laughs> so so I, do, I do try to work even that in nowadays just because of that. But I mean, I agree. Like most, most like newspaper lengths that you're writing at, like 800 to 1,000 words, it's really hard to get any kind of intelligent discussion of it, unless if there's, there's some weird aspect of the book that really makes the translation the story in some sense. In which case, you know, it's a fairly important thing that you can work into the flow. Cool. Well, mentioning a translation is also going to allow it to be pulled by search engines. You know, mm -hmm. if, if often the, the header is going to be you know, an image rather than text. And so it might be that that one line mention is the only place the translator is going to be searchable. Mm. OK, so I just wanted to caveat that. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I mention the language, yep. I would mention the translator. I would not, I mean, oh. as a translator, and I mean, and I remember um, translating a book that I think I improved greatly in translation. <laughs> I think I made it palatable in English. Um, <laughs> And I remember all of the reviews talked about the gorgeous language. And it just, mm. to me, as the translator, it was like over and over and over again, what wonderful language this woman had. And I remember thinking it's, it's how offensive it was that there was no mention of the fact that it was a translation. Wow. So as a reviewer, if I say the language is beautiful, I am going to credit the translator. I yeah. didn't mean to yeah. say that. Okay. I just meant I wouldn't put it in pro forma. That's fair. If, if the discussion, yeah, yeah, that's no, yeah I, I, I agree. Yeah. And, and I think there is a difference between like talking about kind of the aesthetics or the larger structural issues of a book versus like the language in a very specific sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, one is a lot more easily attributable to the original author than the other. So, I mean, I do try to kind of have that distinction and praise people accordingly. Taxi. I've never personally run for Rain Taxi, so I don't know. But I wonder if, if you have some guidelines, whether formal or informal, for whether you want the reviewer of a book in translation to discuss the actual quality of the translation. Is that we can weigh in here? Uh, the answer is uh, no. no. Um, and in listening to to, uh, to Scott and Minna here, I was think I was reflecting that um, you know our pieces really have run the gamut from those that. Yeah, I mean, we identify any translated book in the header for, mm -hmm. for search purposes um, and, and for acknowledgement purposes before there was search. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's the right thing to do, obviously. But there are pieces that won't discuss um, uh, the, tr the translation at all. Um, largely, I think, for the reason Scott was talking about. It's just not part of the fabric of that short piece. Um, and there are pieces that you know, we'll go into what some readers might find a bit too much, um, you know, interrogation of the quality of a certain transliterative, mm -hmm. you know, element. 
Uh, and we don't, you know, we kind of want people to um, follow their bliss a little bit, and um, but and mostly, you know, connect. If that's the way they're going to connect with it, um, and and the remembering that the third element out there is their reader, their audience, mm -hmm. our audience, mm -hmm. and who how that person's going to um, become engaged in that conversation mm -hmm. is is really key. So. Yeah, long answer, but we find it more useful not to have strict guidelines about how to do it. Wow, this is also fascinating. As someone who, uh, most of whose uh, published reviews of translations were in rain tax, <laughs> um, I, uh, I think that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll second that and say that Eric never gave me strong guidelines uh, beyond, you know, uh, write the way that you think is right. That said, I got the sense that uh, you know, Eric's goal of finding the right person for a review was finding someone, at least in my case, who could and would talk about uh, the quality of the translation and the quality of the writing and have that be, you know, both an integrated topic and, an, and integral to, 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 the, to, the, to the point of, of the review itself. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like a pro forma kind of, oh, you know, ably translated by or seamlessly translated by. I don't, I don't like that any, any better than anybody else, but I do think that's better than nothing. Uh, and, and, and better than that is a discussion where translation uh, is uh, ultimately the, the point uh, of the review. Um, I won't write a review. I barely write anything where translation isn't, isn't the main point of what I'm talking about. Um, every so often I may have a discussion that's not ultimately about translation, but even then, pretty much, it's all I have to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have many people who agree with you. <laughs> Um, I, I know my audience. Yes, yes. And, and I, I just wanted to say, for those who haven't read it, uh, Edith Grossman has a fabulous discussion of what's wrong with the phrase ably translated in her book, Why Translation Matters. So I just want to recommend, if, if reading about that makes you happy, I want to recommend that book. And uh, now, so, you know, as you can probably tell, this discussion has two broad components. First, we got some input from editors on uh, what's going on in uh, the translation landscape, and now we're going to switch a little bit, and uh, Lucina is going to uh, ask some questions about why uh, translators should do it, okay? What translators can do about the situation. All right, Lucina. Yeah, so I'd like to continue with the, the discussion that Lucas just started. Um, and if you could talk a little bit more about, um, do, you, do you only review books from languages that you know, and do you think that's important? Um, most of the books that I've reviewed have been assigned to me, oh. um, mostly by her. Uh, and, and, and so because of that, um, uh, most of the books that I have reviewed have, have, have been uh, other people's translations uh, from Chinese into English, usually poetry, but, but not always. Uh, one of the particular, uh, one of my favorite reviews that, that, that I wrote was uh, when Eric asked me to write a review of Andrew Wagenstein's uh, Bulgarian novel translated into English called uh, Farewell Shanghai. And so the reason that he asked me to, to I expect, was this was a book about, about uh, that took place in China, but it was a book uh, talking about the experience of, um, uh, uh, in the Jewish community in Shanghai under uh, Japanese-occupied Shanghai when Japan were allies with, uh, with ax access, allies with Nazi Germany, right, during World War II, uh, and a novel written in Bulgarian. Uh, I was in grad school at the time, had a friend who was Bulgarian, we had a university library where I could access the, the, uh, the, the, the source text, and uh, with my friend Rawson, we went through a couple of passages, and he told me generally how it was translated, and I was able to talk about the translation in, uh, in what I thought was an, was, was an, an intelligent and an approachable way, uh, even when I didn't know the source language. Uh, and I, I felt like I was able to do that um, because I know how to talk about translation. Uh, certainly, I, you know, I, I can do better talking about translation from a language I know, but I think that there are things that we as translators understand about translation that the vast majority of the world does not understand. And I really think that we should be reviewing as much uh, translation as possible, even, and maybe even especially, from languages uh, who, where, where the source language we, we were not familiar with. Uh, and there's another reason that I, that I say this, and this is, again, this has to do with um, you know, uh, the, the point about e editors finding the right people for their, uh, to, to, to assign their reviews to. If that's too narrow, uh, then, then that becomes a problem, right? Um, I, you know, for, for a long time I felt like I was the Chinese literature guy for Rain Taxi. 
Then I moved out, you know, I moved out of the United States, and Rain Taxi, you know, uh, their budget for for for, uh, for postage could no longer reach me. <laughs> and, and and then I published a translation, and I was really looking forward to Rain Taxi reviewing my book, and it never happened because there was no other Chinese poetry guy. Uh, Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't know the details of that, and I don't, I don't tell you the person. Uh, uh, much well, maybe, maybe you're just like, maybe you're just like why, why, why review for him? You know, he, he never wrote, he never gave anybody a favorable review in the eight years that he was uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, pro probably uh, maybe something like that, but I'll, I'll, I'll pretend it was, you know, that he tried really hard to find someone who didn't have it. No, but the, but, but the fact is that, uh, you know, you were talking about translators being more proactive in, in framing their work and so on. You know, I, I, I published a book. It had, it, I wrote uh, an introduction where I felt like I covered the context of uh, I felt like I covered the context of the poetry that was that was being translated and, and so on, where the author was coming from, uh, you know, individually, historically, in, in terms of literature. Uh, and I was very fortunate to, in, in the reviews that I got for this book. Some of the some of the reviews were written by people in this room. So obviously fortunate. Uh, and yet, right? Also, these reviews were written by people who said things very similar to what I was saying in my introduction. <laughs> and I felt like, I also think that uh, the other part of translation is how this works in the target text, right? how this comes across in English. And I was really hoping that there could be someone who didn't know about China and didn't feel like the, the goal of the review was to introduce <laughs> China to the, review, to the readership of the review, but rather to say, in terms of poetry in English that we acknowledge as a translation, how do we, how do we, how do we approach this? Where does this fit into uh, in terms of you know a sort of a target-centered uh, uh, review, and that, as long as we're talking about the, the, the political uh, sort of a aspect of, of, of uh, reviewing translations, that that's something that I feel like, uh, for pretty good reasons, we've actually turned into a place that that, that has that we're, we're going to find ourselves surrounded by a handful of dead ends and and, and cult de sac. Um, I think that uh, you know I'd like to see in reviewing, uh, I'd like to see more discussion of of uh, what these translations are for, rather than just only where they're coming from. Obviously, where they're coming from is very important, but, um, but uh, you know, when I translate, I'm not only translating to explain China or Chinese poetry to, uh, 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 you know, to a broader audience. Uh, the audience of China is actually pretty broad on its own. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to do that for a certain community, right? The reviews that I've written, whether for, for Rain Taxi, whether, whether there's a, a, a uh, a general set of aesthetic sort of uh, you know kind of taste markers that the readership has there, or for academic uh, for, for academic venues where where you know the discussion of translation is a little bit different, and you might want to talk about how this is going to work in a classroom, and you know, how much the book costs, and, and whether that's prohibitive, and, and so on. Whether this is just one more anthology, you know, when that's all that we've had for the last thirty years, uh, you know, things like that. Um, you know, I, so so it, it, you know it, 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 you as translators, I think that. The more that you can, the more that you and we can review works uh, of translation, uh, where maybe we don't know the source language, that will open up new possibilities for the discussion of translation, for people's awareness of translation, and I think that could be a good thing. So you and other other panelists, maybe Scott, both of our Scots, um, weigh in on this. Uh, do you think that translators have a responsibility to advocate for other translators in reviewing, and when? translation is so, you know, hardly discussed in reviews, how do you approach a, a more negative or critical review of mm. translation? I mean, I, I don't know if, if I would say like a responsibility. I think it would be a really nice thing to do to advocate for other translators. I mean, I don't know, I guess like, like the counterfactual would be do people who just write natively in English advocate for other people who write in English? And I think the answer to that is yes and no. Um, like if you if you look at kind of the it books that are the big darlings of New York publishing these days, if you look on the back of them at all the raves, like it's the day, same like five to ten people who are raving each other. So like right there is like a form of solidarity and help that you know, and and the connections that all those people have are getting those books covered by the Times and stuff like that. Um, they were, or even like on a much smaller level, you know, like there are certain communities that form, like in the American MFA scene, there are lots and lots of sub-communities, and those people are very active on the web, helping one another out. So, I mean, I feel like definitely there's a sense of solidarity that forms around certain aesthetics, and translation is, you know, the same in that sense. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, maybe I wouldn't go so far as to say responsibility. That just seems like, you know, like I think people have right to be left alone, or if you just want to do your thing, like, you can do that. But, but definitely, um, just to echo some of the things that Lucas said, you know, translators and people who edit and work in translation understand those principles just innately a lot more than people who don't. And so, you know, you're going to talk about it from a much more informed perspective, even if you don't know the, the, uh, the source language, even if you don't have any idea of the original culture it came out of, you're just going to be looking at things and just keying in on stuff in a much more intelligent way. You know, so, like, you may not say anything stupid in your review that's going to offend someone, which probably seems really basic to you, but <laughs> it's actually like a really high standard to live up to if, if you look at a lot of translation reviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I actually chime in? Um, I guess because I know you talked about negative reviews at breakfast, and I missed that. Um, but the, uh, I, I do tend to get assigned books um, from Italian because, and it's useful that I know the culture around the books. Often I know the authors. Um, so I can speak from a more informed perspective. Um, there's also you know, the little kind of competitive beast in me that's like the, uh, the, uh, you know, the other Italian translators are making choices that I wouldn't have made, which I actually think is in a discussion that belongs in a review. Um, it's sort of something that you just tell yourself at home. Um, <laughs> but in terms of, but what I think is interesting that is that, um, is that I, um, so I'll sometimes get books that I don't think are translated well from the Italian for whatever reason, um, and I won't review them. Um, I don't because just as a reviewer, and this covers translated works and untranslated works, um, I did a couple of, of negative reviews when I was very green and very young and arrogant. And um, not, o not only do I regret them, but um, I found over the years that it's much more interesting to figure out what works in a book Absolutely. than what doesn't. So if I get a book that I think sucks, I don't really want to spend the time with it. Um, and I don't actually think that I want to tell people not to read something. It's much more interesting to tell people to read something and why to read something and why something's working. I so I would, I mean, so yeah. it's, it's not, it's not like a rah, rah, only nice things. It's just, I actually think critically, it's much more, it's a much more interesting challenge to figure out what's going on that's right rather than what's going on that's wrong. Um, and so, so if as the extra little competitive thing where I see more flaws with, uh, with an Italian translator, translation, the, um, that might add to that. But, um, but generally speaking, I think it's, it's more interesting to, uh, to know more and to be able to talk about what's going on that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just, I, I agree with it's more interesting to figure out why a book's working. I guess just one caveat, like sometimes books suck in really interesting ways. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean either like, like it's a really big author and this book is just an outlier or it didn't work, or, you know, or it's something that, it's just, you know, it, it fails in some important way, but there's also a lot that's right about it. And so overall for you, this is not a successful book, but it's really kind of interesting to tease out like where things went off course or why something just wasn't working. And I mean, and this can be, you know, very subjective, maybe just for you personally, this book failed. And, you know, and so you could acknowledge like, this just kind of killed it. And I'm interested in understanding why that is, but it may not kill it for you, you know, someone else is reading your review. Yeah, yeah I'd love so, to concur some, with... Some the, books suck, right? Some books are shit, and, and the world needs to know why. Right? Well, and that, <laughs> that's... <laughs> but, I, I do but not endorse a, that. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, we could certainly have it both ways, and, and just to your original question, really, um, I think that, that we're... You're, it's not important that one advocates for another translator or another writer mm -hmm. or supports that person personally. What I think one's advocating for in an intelligent piece that appreciates what is it being attempted, that looks at why things work, that perhaps take issue, takes issue with why things don't work, is that we're advocating for a culture that values that labor. And that, I think, is really the, the, the key element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have very high standards for, 
for uh, for translation, and you know I have not always met that. Right? I've published shit myself. Uh, I won't tell you which of you know the pieces that I've published are shitty translations. You can find that on your own. Uh, but uh, you know I, I I don't regret the negative reviews uh, that I've. That I that I published, and uh, I I have a lot of fun reading negative reviews of, of, of books uh, as well. I, I don't want the you know I don't want to pick up a, a, a bunch of book reviews and feel like I'm reading ad copy. You know I don't want everything to be like oh this is great go buy this go buy this go buy this great now I have less money more shit to read. And, I never I, I never I, buy I, that. I, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to uh, I'm, I'm happy to say oh great I can avoid that now thanks very much. You know, uh, so so I can I, you know I can fulfill that role as as a as a writer of reviews uh, too. Right? Well, I, and, and if that creates a discussion around these issues, then then, then I mean, all, I, all the better. I agree. Like nobody in this room wants to read a bunch of just reviews that read like marketing copy and are very clearly you know not being honest about the feelings or or just not penetrating very deep into what a book is about. Um, but I feel like that can also work for negative reviews. Actually, like. Like so, this this sheet that I'm looking at says Stefan Zweig on it, and that's like a really good example. Like Michael Hoffman, mm -hmm. who is just like a really noted sour, mean man. I mean, I'm sure he's really nice, but <laughs> but in like his critical stance, he often comes off like that, which is cool. I mean, it's like it's his niche, and he writes really really interesting reviews for the London Review of Books because of it. But like I remember, he wrote a really infamous review about Stefan Zweig, where he basically you know called him like lesser Joseph Roth and just every savage thing you could think about a person to say. And I felt like that review actually wasn't very sincere. Um, he he quoted a lot of like stuff out of context. You know, a lot of things that made Zweig look really bad, or like things where he was praising his contemporaries, and it just. It felt, you know, a little disingenuous to me. Like he had a bit of an agenda, and he was trying to, you know, get an argument across more than actually registering a, a d deeply felt belief about Stefan Zweig. So, you know, negative reviews can be like that too. Even though I would agree that it's usually more the uh, overly generous reviews that come off that way. Uh, let me just follow up on the Zweig. Uh, review by Hoffman, because that's one, th one thing I'm working on and teaching right now is Stefan Zweig. And one question is, how does this, I mean, so Hoffman is representative of much of the feeling about Zweig among, you know, Germanists, among the, in the academy. So hmm. Stefan Zweig is not on anybody's doctoral reading list. But, but when Zweig goes out of copyright, all of a sudden, um, the Pushkin Press is, you know, putting out a book a month, right? <laughs> and w with good translators, Anthea Bell, who did Zemal, has done some of those translations. And I think Hoffman is having a real hissy fit because he just thinks that Zweig is really a, a mediocre writer from the middle of the century. And then he has his, his shtick, which he has, as you mentioned, more broadly, that he, he is like Mr. Crotchety, and that's his thing, and everybody wants to read Hoffman because it's just so, it's like schadenfreude at its best, right? <laughs> um, but that in the, in the sort of, you know, academic Germanist circles um, really generated a lot of, of serious engagement with Zweig now. Um, you know, how do we judge what's good or not, and what's the relationship of, of Zweig's sort of um, typical, you know, often uninteresting mid-century prose uh, to his place in exile and to his suicide and to all these kinds of other things. So, for, so Hoffman is talking about Zweig's language mostly, but for, for most readers, uh, new readers of Zweig, it's really all about context and history. So in a lot of ways. And so Hoffman, Hoffman put that on the table for mm -hmm. people who knew enough to pay attention instead of like, gosh, I'm never reading him. Now, yeah, right? yeah. So that, I don't know who he's speaking to, but I think more to me than to other people, <laughs> other people who don't know the German mid-century context, the Austrian mid-century context. I'd, I'd like to just chime in though and say, as a reader, I'm sort of glad that some media, mediocre writers and books get translated. I, want, I think there's a place for that, and I think mm. part of that place <laughs> is to ask and answer the questions yeah. you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't, you know, we shouldn't have such an insular party that there's you know only a handful of people at the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Zweig is fun to read because he's not, you know, Hermann Brock or something. I mean he's fun to read because you can read him. 
Yeah. And most sort of mid-century German modernists who are canonized are just horror, you know? Yeah. yeah so finally we get somebody who's talking about Austria and it's like really engaging and you want to turn the pages yeah. instead of like, oh shit, you know, how, what is that? <laughs> what are these, why am I reading Musil? You know, this is just no yeah. fun, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> though, I, though I teach yeah. Musil too, right? Yeah. So that's, but slowly, right? So. Scott, uh, you were talking earlier this morning, Scott Denham. Mm -hmm. um, is there a correlation between the invisibility of trans translation and reviews and the invisibility of translation in the academy? Yeah, very much so. That was uh, in the sort of Homer example. Yeah. You know, um, there's just never any engagement with um, translators. And so imagine, you know, Whatever we've got a set of distribution requirements, general education requirements for really smart students who are asked to do. You know, they're, uh, are, we have a, a very rigorous curriculum, um, and you know, probably four fifths of what they read in their first two years in the humanities and social sciences is in translation, and there's zero acknowledgement of that. You know, if they're in their social theory class or theory of anthropology or um, most things in the religion department. Um, philosophy, world lit, I mean, you know, there's just, that's just not on the table at all. And so, in some ways, that's part of our, the group of us who are talking about the theory and practice of literary translation is to, is to bring that to the table, you know, bring, bring that um, element of really invisibility of the translator in the academy when it's not the, at, at the center of things, um, at least into discussion. It's, it's really it's entertaining, you know, to, to listen to uh, colleagues get really excited about you know some passage in whatever you know Max Weber or Durkheim or something, and they have they're, it's they're parsing you know lexically what's going on, and that's just not enough, right? I mean that's just not enough if you're yeah. or Kant, for example, you know there's a seminar on Kant that's taught by this wonderful kind of rock star teacher who has a cult following, and he doesn't know any German. So Which I guess is okay, I, but it's just different from the way it should be. Right? So I mean, I, I have a like I, I have a question for the group, um, like you in particular, but anyone else who knows about like that kind of a setting. I mean, I agree that it's really lamentable that you have people reading all these texts that have been translated, and there's never a mention of it. And there should at least, at the very least, be an awareness that these things are translations. Mm -hmm. But like, like in a very kind of material sense like for the benefit of the course, or for the benefit of the students, like what do you feel is brought to that discussion by actually acknowledging the translation and bringing that more into the light? Ambiguity, you know, move, so kind of post-structural questions. The text is not this thing carved in stone, the text has a context, the text has readers, different translators present different understandings and make different choices. So, and especially for my philosopher colleagues, right? who think like things mean what they say. To talk about translation just destabilizes everything, which makes for great teaching and great classroom mm -hmm. moments because it empowers these young, new readers um, to be able to make judgments that they, they you know, can defend. So it's about, for me, it's about ambiguity and, to point that out, yeah. And, and, and to add on, on to that a little, I, uh, less post-structurally um, would be just historicity mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the fact that it creates an awareness that our language changes over time, and I think especially for students Absolutely. to understand that that you know the language we're speaking now is is far from static uh, is a, is a, can be a profound experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just want to express my gratitude to Scott and to Eric for making these comments because you know I, I spent a decade writing on the Bible and it astonishes me the certainty with which people will quote an individual biblical translation because they're <laughs> sure that that's what it says and I, I think I, we see that throughout the academic context just mm -hmm. absolutely no no thought to uh, the mm -hmm. centuries the centuries that have passed mm -hmm. very interesting yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to switch gears and ask one more question and then I think we should open it up to everyone <coughs> questioning yeah, one another. But um, uh, Scott brought in the, the social media aspect. Um, and one of the campaigns that's been popular over the past year or two has been the hashtag name the translator. Mm. So um, when one sees a review in a major publication where the translator is not acknowledged, even in the heading, even in the byline, 
um, you then tweet it and you go hashtag name the translator and enough people do it and you shame the publication into then <laughs> recognizing the translator. Um, do people do that? Is that where we should be putting our energy? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Shaming publication. I'm, 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 I was gonna. So like, like, like I got named the translator because like I just <laughs> like I. I got this new book by Alejandro Zambra uh, that McSweeney's is publishing, and I thought it was really cool. Like, I love him, and I know a lot of people are really excited about him. So, like, I just tweeted a picture of it. Like, I didn't actually name the author. I think it was just like, oh, this is cool from McSweeney's, and it was like a picture of the cover. And, like, someone named the translator me, and I was just like, really? Like, come on. So, I mean, yeah, like, like there's definitely you should be out there like saying like hey there's a translator attached to this but like there's a cool way and a not cool way to do it <laughs> and, and definitely like the like a cool way would be shaming Scott. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't ever don't ever step to me no but i mean like like you know there are people who are on your side or at least are trying to be on your side and like right. ask those people nicely and then there are just people who are never going to get in or are complete assholes and yeah just totally Say whatever you want to that. But I mean, yeah, just be aware of the context. I, I'll just say, I've, I've actually never, I don't, I don't tweet. I do have a, a pretty active Facebook account, but I've never hashtagged anything. But that notwithstanding, I'm very supportive of shaming organizations that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that deserve shame. You know, uh, individual reviewers who, who uh, you know, make excuses for not naming the translators and their editors who say, oh, well, you know, it's, it would be cumbersome. You know, screw that. You know, I'm not cumbersome. I'm an important part of this book and its and its distribution into this language. And uh, you know, and, and and my friends and I deserve recognition. I have I have no problem, you know, uh, shaming. Like you know, be, you know, be cool about it and don't shame Scott. But like, <laughs> uh, I, I I have no problem with that kind of uh, you know uh, with that kind of uh, with that element of advocacy for what we do. At the um, back in the olden days, before hashtags um, and Facebook and social media, at Penn, um, we used to have a watchdog committee where we would uh, write letters, right. um, <laughs> put them in envelopes, and mail them to the publications. Where Talk we, about I know, <laughs> and and hardly a groundswell, you know, <laughs> from then. And we'd send letters to the New York Times or to whatever oh. review that hadn't. And it was exactly the same thing. It was, you have neglected to include the translator. And that is a disservice to the lit literary citizenship. And um, shame on you. Um, and um, I, I don't know how effective we were, but we did do it diligently. It was, it was just something you did in the pen offices back in the 90s. <laughs> I, I do think, though, and I, I guess I want to uh, echo what Scott maybe said, that, that uh, a lot of these people actually are on your side or potentially on your side. Mm -hmm. and, and rather than shame, uh, there might be a way to invite them into a broader and more sophisticated sense mm -hmm. of what we're doing as a culture and why they can participate and help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful comment. Yeah. 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 Oh. Um, yeah, we'd like to open it up um, to to all of you and as well to the panelists to ask one another question. Wow. Um, in the back there? Yeah. Just briefly, I heard on the one hand, don't be a second publicist, but on the other hand, provide a roadmap to help the company. So that's, that's the same tension we often feel. So often in our translators forward or the entry, we put that roadmap and we think, now that I've been why in the world would you not read this after this great, you know, forward? So you get so much to read. Do you open up to the chapter, or whatever, or do you, or do editors go to the translators forward? What role does that play in helping you with the road? Um, I think. I mean, and that came up in this panel that we did on this because we had a publicist on the panel who was like, "Stay out of my business." Um, and you know, and I, I understand that you don't want to be a second publicist. I don't. Um, I don't think translators should be composing press releases or no. anything like that. But I do think that, for the most part, in the world of literary publishing and especially in translations, it's um, it, it's a small community. It is a community, it, you know. And we do things like have these conferences. I think that, um, for example, if um, 
if you know somebody at a publication, I mean, if you as a translator were to send the book or send an email even saying, you know, my book's coming out, it's not being a second publicist, it's, it's just being part of the process, not feeling <coughs> shy about your book coming out. Maybe, um, for example, at the Literary Review, we, we publish a lot of work in translation. I try to know if um, one of my translators has a book coming out, we'll pay attention to it and see if we can do something more with it. Um, but, but I don't always know, and, and, um, and we're all so small, you know, do, will I see something, will I miss it? If one of my contributors comes to me and says, I have a book coming out, I just want to make sure you know about it, that actually, that, that has a value to me and it's part, of the, it's part of the community. I want to support our contributors. So for example, in that case, you might write to the magazines that have published you, um, the people you might know, and, and, and email. And that's, that's sort of what I mean, is, is keeping <coughs> part of the process. Um, and uh, yes, of course, if you've written an introduction, there's the story. You might maybe have a little tiny paraphrase of it. You know, I wanted to remind you about this book. I spent years working on this. This is my, this is my labor of love. I found this, this book in an old trunk in an attic in Moldavia, in, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I carried it to the United States wrapped in ham, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it might be, but just giving a little bit of that um, spirit into, the, into your presentation. Yeah, so, and actually, I... I do a fair amount of publicity work, so just to chime in from that angle, um, I think I know exactly who you're referring to um, with the scary don't fuck with my business guy. Um, but so, yeah, like don't, don't try to do the work of the publicist for the publicist. That's going to be really annoying and you may do more harm than good. But if you can give that person pertinent information, like yeah, like you know, a story that's compelling about the book, some facts about like where it came out of, even like raves that may have been in a foreign language press that will be useful, like stuff like that is really helpful. So you can be very helpful to the publicist. And just like from my perspective, if a translator is willing to work with me and be useful in that way, like I love that. So definitely like, yeah, like you can, there's like that room for you to maneuver in. And one thing I'd be curious about is um, uh, in the spirit of the back, well, first of all, not not every book does have a preface. So, in, in in many, so there's a difference when I'm looking at books that do or don't. I'm I'm I have a, it goes into the selection process of finding a writer because there may be a different task at hand. Uh, but even if it does, I'd, in the spirit of the backstory, I'd love to know: is there more? Because what I really value, uh, what I'm looking for, what I value is the intellectual content of what you've done. And so, and that's why I say you don't need to be a second publicist. You're, you're the, you, you have a higher calling there. But maybe there's more to the story, and maybe knowing that is going to contour how I think about placing the book. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maroon shirts. Um, you've, you've addressed this a little bit, but I was just um, going to, I would love you to direct it, address it a little more directly. Um, I'm wondering how much of the time reviewers of translations um, consult the source text. And I mean, it seems to me that even to say ably translated, without having looked, compared the translation with the original, I don't actually understand where that, where, how you can say it's ably translated if you haven't looked at the original. And I understand some of what's been said about, especially Lucas was talking about how there's something to be said for reviewing some languages you don't know. But I, I just, I have no idea, is it like, is it like eighty percent of the time people don't look at the original? Or what is what is the overall um, picture with that? Uh, I mean, just to kind of talk about how I evaluate a translation. Like, I mean, I I speak and read Spanish, so like I definitely can do that sort of comparison when I'm doing a Spanish language book. Um, but I feel like like I try not to look at a translation as like a line by line thing. Like, I don't want to compare the two in that way. I see it more as like, you know, is this whole book a successful thing kind of on the terms like that? Um, and I think, you know, translators get really, really pissed off when you're like, oh, well, this word is actually this word, and you kind of miss it. I mean, and that happens, and maybe you're right, but like, you're totally missing the forest for the trees there. So I don't know, like, like that's kind of the level that I would evaluate it on when I can. And when I can't, I mean, I feel like you can still make some pretty useful statements about a book. I mean, you know, 
if the thing has a consistent tone, if there are like multiple voices in the book and you're getting those right, if you know if the structuring is feeling good. You know, there are things you can talk about without actually being able to compare languages. I think in a non-academic environment, it would be inappropriate to actually review a book like that. The, you have to, as a reviewer, you're reviewing a work of art, and the work of art is a translate is the translation. I think to go in and make some sort of critical evaluation, uh, comparing the original to the to the final, it doesn't seem appropriate for a mainstream publication. It doesn't seem as if it's necessarily interesting. What what readers who don't speak the language want to know what it feels like to read the book in English. I mean, that's what a reviewer's work, especially in a mainstream environment, not in an academic environment, but in a mainstream environment, you're trying to say, I read this book. It was like, you know, I had this experience. It was really cool because of this, or it was really dreadful because of this. And you're talking about the work in English. And so, um, and so, and so it seems inappropriate to do that kind of evaluation, although I do remember um, Kotsia doing that at great length on oh, yeah. Zeno's conscience. Um, He's like a special case, though. It's a special, <laughs> it's a special case. I mean, it was hugely offensive and kind of entertaining. Yeah, but he, only he can do that. I think only Kotsia can do that. <laughs> I always look at the um, source language of the books that I review. It, it, it's pretty common for the books that I review to be uh, translations of Chinese poetry where the left-hand page is very often going to be the Chinese text. So that's not that difficult. Um, but even if I'm reviewing something uh, where I have to do a little bit of work to find the source text, um, and like I said, even with Bulgarian, a language I don't know. You know, I was in a position where I could, where I could do that. Um, uh, part of what I'm talking about, about us as translators explaining translation and how it works to people who don't understand, is to talk about how translation can be good even if there are things that look like inaccuracies you know, at, at, at the sort of the dictionary level, right? Um, and, and trusting that translators have spent enough time with works to, to make informed decisions. Even if we don't agree with them, we can you know, maybe still say, you know, this, this, is what this, this is what this particular word choice does. And it presents this work to a certain audience that may not be my audience or, or, or whatever. You know, I think, I think that that's part of our responsibility and, and part of the advocacy that we have to do uh, for, our, for, our, for our art and our craft. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, but, but I also think that ultimately what is important is that experience of reading in, in the language that we're looking at. And sometimes we're not able to, uh, sometimes we're not able to, 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 to make that. But I think that you know, even if it's a 400 word review, we should be able to have, find a way to have that be an important aspect of of something that uh, that shows up in the review. This, just, it just, it's political, actually. Yeah. Just to yes. get to the title, like I yeah. think it's a political yeah. decision. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. And, and just to say, um, I will compare translations if there are multiple translations of a text. Um, just, I mean, and not again, not necessarily to say one's better than the other, but I'll be curious to see how translators rendered certain passages and which I feel like is more successful or which appeals to me more. So. I mean, that I feel like is definitely a valid thing. One of the um, exercises we do in the theory and practice of literary translation seminar is have students look at about 10 different sections of the uh, front end of book nine of the Iliad and then produce their own. And that's a wonderful piece of intellectual work. And then we're reading people who are just you know, theorists who are asking this kind of question. And um, it's really all about, um, you know, does one domesticate the, the language for now, you know, for the audience of college students on this campus? Or do you want to maintain some kind of distance? And, and especially with verse, that has to do with, you know, how are you going to approximate verse? Are you going to use alliteration rather than rhyme? Or rhythm, or line breaks, or you know, those are choices that you know, for students who've never done this before, that you all you know have to deal with all the time, become really telling. Um, and so, they adopt very quickly a language that involves the word choice rather than you know accuracy. It's all about their sort of creative work, even in these little workshop sessions over 14 weeks. Mm -hmm. So the translating from translations to a new translation is a wonderful way to make that very clear, that even without access to the source text, you can have a, a really good idea of what you want to do and why. Wow. Well, uh, how about, yeah. Okay, I have a question for Nina. Is your 
ideal trans review is a review in which the fact that the book is a translation becomes invisible, that the reader has to think in itself. Because you, you said something, if I'm quoting it correctly. If I mention which language is coming from, I would mention the translator. I try to understand what kind of review is that of a translation where the language from which the book comes is not mentioned. Yeah, um, uh, sorry, um, for someone who works in words, I can be inarticulate. Um, <laughs> I, what I meant to say is if I'm talking about the language of the book in particular, um, I reviewed one of Chad's books, for example, and, the, and it, was, it was a very kind of post-structuralist book where the, the, the translator had found this amazing kind of American idiom to represent the original language. And I was impressed by the way it sound, the way the English was, the choices of the idiom. Uh, so I said that in the review, and I said this is what, you know, the translator made those choices. It was something about the book that I found interesting, in the con you know, to have such a plain spoken idiom and such a complex book. I liked that. That was part of my review. I mentioned it. That's what I meant by if I'm talking about, and that was a case where it really was not, very, um, not a very big part of the review, but where it came up and it was germane to the text. Um, I... So what I mean is, if I'm discussing the language, I will certainly talk about the translator in that context. If I'm talking about if the subject of the review is translation, you know, I've written about purgatory, you know, and there was like six different translations that I was discussing at once. Of course I'm talking about the translation and choices made. Um, a lot of times, though, I will be, I might be reviewing a novel, um, maybe where it's it's not something that is part of the re, of the, of the review and and um, and and in those cases I may not talk about it if I can't fit it in um, and I always try but it doesn't always fit and also um, I don't have an ideal review every every time out it's a, every time out it's like what am I gonna do and it's and there's the story of that review so I don't mean to suggest that I have any kind of um, Idea. Although I do think I probably have a slightly different agenda I'm sure, I'm sure. when I'm sitting down, and I'm also writing for different places, <coughs> um, and that's just about kind of what I'm good at writing about. You know, I'm, I, I think that that's well, what people assign me. Yeah. Er, earlier, also, you uh, I think you expressed a frustration that um, in a review of a translation in which you had improved the language or made it more <laughs> mellifluous, that you weren't that. People were noticing that, but not quite. You weren't quite getting the credit. It was. I mean, it. none. And <laughs> they, they weren't even. Men I mean, that wasn't the heading. It wasn't. It was like as if the book had been had appeared in English. Yeah, but that was you know but, in the olden days but, uh, before uh, the hashtag campaign. Sure, <laughs> and I'm 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 certainly. I mean, you should get the credit for it, but there is a kind of like poetic justice in that. Yeah. Wow, this thing worked so well in English that it was, you know. Uh, it's there. There was a compliment in there. Oh, I was proud an and angry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the, way back. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm a lot of person from the translation community. I'm from uh, my culture, I'm a Sukha. Um, I, as many knows, um, I've been involved in many different stages of um, how translators advocate for um, fuller reviews. Of reviews that take note of them is a key fact. But here's my thought, and, and there are editors here who are, you're looking at copy, you're reviewing it, you're editing it. Let's set a low bar that at least there's a mention in the, the body of the review itself that it's a translation. In other words, um, author X, comma, as translated by blah, blah, comma, and then review. At least that, that can be a universal standard. We are still finding reviews that in, even in the header, no mention of the translator at all. Would you editors commit <laughs> to looking at your copy? And also, um, if you are sending a guidelines to the reviewer, just include that. As you, there has to be some mention of the translator. And this, you know, even just this, um, bit, this parenthetical bit. And I also think you should just take out ably, seamlessly, all these things, just take them out. They, if they want to write about the quality of the translation, it has to be a couple of sentences, or else this saves the translation. 
You want it in the body of the text as well as the head. I mean, what's the commitment, okay, Margaret? Totally, because that's something that's perfect. The header, yes. The translation has to be there. Right. And that can be, you know, complaints about that can be directed to the, um, to the periodical, right? right? Um, within the review itself, comma, as translated by name, or in X's translation, as a, a low bar, and I think that can be universally adopted. Can so I, can you comment on that? Uh, that? Would you want a comment or a commitment? Hear, <laughs> <laughs> hear. Yeah, I think no one on this table is going to disagree with any yeah. of that. Okay, but when you get the copy, you guys should do that. I mean, if I talk, what are your copy editing standards? I mean, you're probably doing some cutting. Well, it's interesting because when, you know, I have, um, I have a little review section, and, and because, um, because we, we don't pay, a lot of times it's, it's new reviewers who um, are reviewing the books. And we, um, when I was working with you on this project, we, institute, we told all the reviewers, we instituted that they had to discuss the translation. And so every time a reviewer got a book in translation, we said, you have to make sure to consider the translation. And what we got were, were just the, the most sort of dreadful, awkward, you know, interpretations of that, often it didn't work in the review, in part because I was working with new reviewers who needed a lot of hand-holding anyway. Um, so, it, I mean, what's interesting is that there is there is a skill level, too, to making this work. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying, it's not a skill, just as you translate by, that's it. Well, I mean, I think that's easy. Okay, but it's not happening. Well, I'll respond to it. I, I agree with you. I have seen that a lot. But I will also say that the problem is wider than just reviews. I will say as someone who teaches as well, I've noticed reviewing syllabi from colleagues, mm -hmm. it's not mentioned on syllabi. Mm -hmm. So I it think that it's a lot right. deeper. I think mm -hmm. that people are educated to ignore translation. Mm -hmm. So by the time you, you get a bachelor's degree, you think that you don't need to mention it. And that, I think, is so, to me, the root comes much earlier. Than, than a reviewer. I mean, most reviewers, you know, have graduated college, right? But they've, they've just been through a few years of ignoring it. And so I would hope, I mean, I, this may not be your purview, but I would hope that Penn Translation Committee would also advocate for inclusion of the word translated by on the syllabi. You know, that's, I'm going to do that. I'm on our, I'm on our curriculum. It would be a pattern. It would be, people would see that that's the norm. Yeah. You know, on the, I'm on, I sit on a curriculum committee where we review, you know, approve new courses, and I'm going to start sending things back if the translator's not in the bibliography. Thank you. So so much. Much. Please revise. Yeah. That's easy for me. You know. <laughs> what? Durkheim didn't write in English? <laughs> uh, one more question. We are over time. We're over time. Okay, well, I'll make this as short as I possibly can. Um, so, book, re book reviewing is part of the greater sort of publishing. Uh, economic mechanism. Now, if a lot of the conversations that we have about reviewing translations uh, are had with the goal of finding ways to sort of break habits. Um, and the publishing mechanism, this question is inspired by some, some stuff that Richard Nash wrote in the past. Um, the, co the, the, the publishing mechanism relies on the idea of the author as the original creator of the work. And the cult of personality sells books now. It's, it's become central. So you know, we talk about Stefan's why. You know, the, the author becomes central to this whole conception. Um, and that is one of the main reasons that translators aren't mentioned, actually. Because the publisher is afraid that if I distract the reader from this famous author name that I'm trying to build um, with this no-name translator, the review is not going to be interesting. The book's not going to sell as well. Now, as so the editors, when you are writing or commissioning reviews, when you're editing reviews, are you, given the pressures that are on you, are you trying to, will you ever try to break away from that model, which is, after all, illusory? Or would you be, are you more apt, are you more apt, sorry, to sort of keep going and we've got a personality, we've got the original writer personality, and now we have a new personality, we have the translator personality. That sort of segues into the next panel, actually, yeah. I think. Yeah.
but it yeah. Uh, as, as an editor, I'm not trying to sell books. So the irony of what you're saying is that uh, in many cases, the foreign language author is not so well known, and the translator has a position of prominence. So quite often, I'm like, ooh, so and so translated this thing. It must be cool. Sometimes it's not cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but it's it's often there's an inversion there. But yeah, but I mean, like with Elena Ferrante, for example, who's huge right now and has this sort of massive personality of who is she? People, you know, they're writing about her right and left. I think that um, I think it would be. Hard. I mean, I, we're not in the position of selling books, I guess. It's. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. That your you're represent. Nice. I mean, you're representing a very, a very. That's what the editors say. That's what Richard Nash says. That's what FSG says. That's what the publishing houses say. That's their. The publicists say. That's the business of, of selling the books, and they're going to use anything to sell books because books are hard to sell, and, and I don't know if that's a question. For us necessarily, but but as reviewers, we're going to take what we've got. You know, and if they they've got a lot of apparatus that is given to us around the, the personality of the author, then that's some of the material we have to work with. That's the that's the the, the, the primordial ooze of our work. I would say Fronte is kind of an interesting case because I mean she herself or whoever actually is her, um, she has a really interesting story. But the translator does too. I mean, it's Anne Goldstein who like works at the New Yorker, and I'm surprised I don't see that more than I do. But anyways, that's I don't know, that's an interesting case study. Okay, we are so out of time. I see one very determined person back there. If you can ask your question super quickly. Yeah. Okay. Sure. okay. It's safe to probably say that with you in the translation, and if the uh, translator's name is not mentioned, we are translating a work from book by book, and we will not compare in the translation. So who's the work we are Okay. <laughs> all right, well, on that note, um, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful panelists for the time and the wisdom. <laughs> Thank you both. That was wonderful. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Thank you all of you. Thank 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 you. Thank